শারদে ভিডিও আন अवेलेबल বলছে আমাকে দেখাচ্ছে লাইভ ইভেন্ট উইল বিগিন ইন 2 মিনিটস একটু দেখেনি কারণ আমি অলরেডি গো লাইভ করে দিয়েছি আমার সিস্টেম থেকে গুড ইভনিং আপনি নব দা আমি প্রথম ফেসবুকে দেখি তাপসের লেকচার তাতে অবভিয়াসলি আই ওয়াজ এক্সাইটেড টু লিসেন টু হিম অল দা টাইম হোয়েন এভার আই গেট এন অপরচুনিটি টু লিসেন হিম সব সময় ব্যবহার করি এই সময় গুড ফরচুন আই এম অলসো ওয়ান অফ ইজ স্টুডেন্ট ইমেজিন মাই এজ প্রবীর সি देयर ইজ নো এজ লিমিট ফর মাই লার্নিং फ्रॉम এ গ্রেট পারসন ওকে গুড ছবি <laughs> 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 হ্যাঁ ইউটিউব স্ট্রিমিং এও তাই দেখাচ্ছে সরো দিদি জিওলজি দুর্গাপুর গভর্নমেন্ট কলেজ ওয়েলকাম অল অফ ইউ to this uh, third golden jubilee lecture to be delivered by professor tapos bhattacharya of the university of calcutta actually a uh, professor bhattacharya doesn't need any introduction but uh, there are lot of freshers so i would request srijata to introduce our speaker So, Srijata, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I am honored to have this opportunity to introduce the honorable speaker of this afternoon, Professor Tapas Bhattacharya. An alumnus of Arshtwal Presidency College, Professor Bhattacharya did his PhD from the University of California in USA. Over the last 39 years, He is imparting quality education to generations of students of different universities and institutions across India and abroad, including Allahabad University, IAACR Kolkata, Florida State University, USA, and of course, the University of Calcutta. Besides being a great teacher, Professor Bhattacharya enriched the knowledge base of art science through his cutting-edge research in structural geology global tectonics 
geomathematics and early evolution of the earth he has in his credit 20 research articles published in different frontline journals today he will enlighten us with his talk on art and science of plate tectonics since we all are eagerly waiting to hear from professor bhattacharya with this brief introduction may i invite professor bhattacharya sir please oh i thank uh, the college who is hosting the organization i think the organization is run by the students and i feel rather privileged to be the speaker for the third meeting of this organization i have the impression and i have been reaffirmed by dr pravin dashkutta that the purpose of this talk will be to introduce and partly enlighten the new entrants into art sciences the students who are just very fresh just out of school maybe having a four or five months of geology undergraduates and in the same way i was informed that maybe there will be people from other semesters but the composition of the audience which is very impressive but at the same time a little bit uneasy for me because i i i am trying to aim the students who are very fresh and the topic i chose plate tectonics by itself it's a subject it's not just geology not just physics chemistry or paleontology but you can take it as a different subject altogether so to do a justice to the subject the plate tectonics within this short span of time and with my kind of expertise will be rather difficult if not impossible so what i originally thought of is i'll briefly introduce what the idea of this plate tectonics because when we are students like you those who are here plate tectonics and i'm talking about early 1970s to be precise, I, I got introduced to geology in 1972. So at that time, plate tectonics was in its boom. It was developing really fast. And at that time, computers were not there. If you have to have a computer, you have to go in India, three or four places. A computer is about a cinema hall type, size room, all kind of things. So both the researchers and teachers in India, in spite of their real real good merit intelligence who have not introduced to the new concepts so we have very rudimentary ideas about what it is we just used to say continental drift then you are lucky to have a great teacher who used to get touch with the western world for the logic so he gave us a very simple introduction to it and we found it very simple and rather unassuming but after later years when i was able to interact and listen to those big tectonicians i realized he, he gave us the right background so it's really a gratitude that i must pay to him for this thing so let us start with this what i'll do i'll try to take a journey starting from early 1900 century so 1910 till about mid 1970s to show how the concept developed and the purpose is not only the concept not only the science unless there are scientists science is like light unless somebody something reflects it's on you you won't see it so scientists are those mirrors and i'll try to tell stories about the scientists what you felt how it happened we can write volumes on it. Time is short. I have already consumed about four, four minutes talking about it. So that is the whole aim of this thing. Let me go into the slides. This is the topic, the art and science of plate tectonics. And the photograph that I'm showing, it's a satellite image. And I'll come back to it and try to explain why I have put it as a signature one. We all know 
earth has a shape of an orange it is not exactly sphere it is kind of having a shorter polar radius than the equatorial radius though only 21 22 kilometers different so it is just like the orange in shape from outside but there are similarities between earth and the orange too when you cut an orange if i slice an orange what you see there is a thick skin rind peel whatever you call which is kind of rigid and which is covering the juicy juicy part which kind of flows easily more easily if i squeeze we can see the juice coming out of it so we have a kind of a hard shell covering the under the same stress lithosphere will not flow but these things will flow and it's a part of mantle and for our purpose we use its geological property how it flows we call it asthenosphere so we are having in earth two layers just like in an orange lithosphere 100 kilometers thick and then below asthenosphere today we won't go beyond this much limit of asthenosphere where, where it ends what Actually, happens there the... i'll just bypass that because initially the tectonics was framed different. to understand what goes Dreaming on in the atmosphere so and try to explain why it what is the screen screen. besides this there is a very interesting similarity as well as a difference between the lithosphere of the earth and the skin of the orange the peel we used to do in the younger days you take the peel of the orange you put it between your forefinger and thumb and squeeze it and there will be jet of juice will come out of it and we used to project it to my friend's eyes to make it irritate. So that means, though we are calling it rigid, it can be bent. But the moment I take the pressure out, it bounces back to its original shape. In that sense, it is rigid. In the sense, rigid means, if I take a slice of this peel, and if I can put it on a table and push it with a finger, it will move without much change in shape as a single body, as an entirety. That's the notion of rigidity in our purpose of lithosphere. The orange peel, when it is fresh, can be squeezed, can be bent. Allow it to dry for two, three days. It will lose its juice. You cannot bend it. It becomes rigid. If you try to bend it, it will crack. Lithosphere has the same behavior. The normal lithosphere is dry, stone dry almost. You cannot bend it. But to have plate tectonics, to have life on earth, you have to make it bend. We'll see why. And to make it bend, you must add water to it, just like the skin of the orange. So if you add water to the lithosphere, it can be bendable. If it is dry, you can and we will see why it is important to bend it. Otherwise, you cannot sustain plate tectonics. Now, in the case of orange, in case of earth, this skin lithosphere. But in art, this skin is broken into smaller fragments. So the lithosphere, which is in our style, rigid object, is not an entire single shell, quite unlike the orange shell. You break it into smaller portions, but there is no gap between the breaks. So they fit very tightly with respect to each other, and they are in a constant state of movement with respect to each other. So this fragment of lithosphere, we call this fragments plate, which is on the average about 100 kilometers thick, but there are other things added to it. This fragment is moving with respect to that. This is moving with respect to that. The science of plate tectonics deals with these plates. What is the type of their movement? What happens when they do it? So it is mainly started as the geometry of movements and the resultant, and later gradually it expanded to include why are they moving? Well, I will bypass that for this small one hour talk. So I will stick to the major part of plate tectonics, the initial part of plate tectonics, where 
it tried to first establish there are plates and plates are moving and these movements are causing the geology in a quick rough estimate 90 percent of the geology we see on the surface of the earth is almost directly controlled by plate tectonics but the features created by plate tectonics might okay, be acted upon by the agencies of atmosphere and hydrosphere okay, because okay, the surface okay. processes <laughs> are controlled by this the temperature derived from sun humidity and chemistry that controls the surface processes <laughs> so they modify the features produced by plate tectonics like the himalayan <laughs> mountain <laughs> chains are <laughs> product of plate tectonics but they are being constantly modified by <laughs> agencies <laughs> like rain sun and we know there are landslides and all kinds of things going on For generations, there are a quite a few sharp minds when they looked at the map of the art, they were all struck by some very unique features of it. This is the map of the solid outer surface. We have taken the water out of the ocean, so you are looking at the ocean bottoms, the depth of the color, the darker means deeper, the shallower means shallow, the these lighter means shallower, and these are the high mountains. Man was amazed, at least I can name two or three of them, starting from 16th century, that there is a fantastic match and very special between the two sources of Atlantic, the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Here we are in India, in Bengal, Calcutta, here we are, and this is Bay of Bengal, Indian Ocean, this is Atlantic, Southern and Northern. They found, if I look closely, there is a fantastic match, just like a magic, I can do a little bit of trick. I can close the Atlantic. And if I close the Atlantic, these two coasts match very nicely with each other. Of course, there are gaps and other things, but these are much more refined. That made man wonder what could be the reason for it. This is the first recorded person, Abraham Otilius. In 1596, wrote a book. Remember, Wagner, the father of modern concept of this dynamic art, wrote his book in 1915. This gentleman is 300 years older than that. He was a Belgian. He wrote a book called Thesaurus Geographicus. Belgian language and the Dutch languages are very complex, called famous. Not very many people can read it. He was a cartographer, map maker. Very intelligent and mathematically sound person used to do cartography in those days. And why cartography became important? In those days, Europeans, some of them are called explorers, adventurers, but many of them are pirates. They used to sail through the oceans to discover new lands, not for the sake of discovery only, but to trap and use their resources. And they used to bring piecemeal information, hand-drawn maps. And he put all these maps together. And what he saw is fantastic. He described that he was surprised to find that this bulge of Africa nicely fits with this recess of North America. And this protuberance of northeastern corner of South America fits into the recess of Africa, the bite. And he proclaimed there must be something going on that they fit so nicely. So once upon a time, there is no Atlantic Ocean. Unfortunately, like many great discoveries, it remained in the bookshelves till look at the date, 1994. In 1994 came a paper in Nature by a professor from a New York college, Ram, J. Ram. He discovered the book and reported it. Then there is a big silence after this 1596. 300 years after, this gentleman, Alfred Wegener, came into being and shook the world and get too much abused by the scientific community. Who was he? He was a physicist by training, very top-notch physicist. His priorities was meteorology, study of weather, climate pattern. Geology was not his first love, never did geology. He has many records to his credit at that time. He has, you know, his brother has the record, world record of highest elevation achieved in a gas balloon. Incredible. 
He was a great fighter. He fought in the First World War, got severely injured in his legs. It took him two years to recuperate. And what he did in these two years? Wrote the most revolutionary book in art science, Origin of Continents and Ocean, while he was in bed and trying to cure himself. What he claimed? He claimed this matching that I am showing you is not a coincidence. What he said that the continents were together and later broke apart. If I make it full, somebody requested share full screen. Is it any better, Prabir? Now it is okay, please. Okay, sure. So what he did is he claimed that this is not coincidence and there is scientific evidence, four lines of evidence he pre presented that proves that there is no reason to believe they are not together. Those were the days of fixists, nothing moves, no continents, nothing moves. They are born by some magic and they remain like that. The entire I mean, scientific community pounced on him. He was called mad. He has been insulted in the meetings, all kinds of things. He did not budge. He was silent. He never kind of argued openly. He has one good luck. He has a father-in-law who was also a big physicist, at the same time, very politically powerful person. He protected his son-in-law and projected him. But he never liked his son-in-law looking at glaciers, not doing physics. Why I'm talking about glaciers? I'll come to that. This is what Wagner's idea we see here, say about 150, 4 million years ago, the African continent and South American continent were together. It actually was, it is the Western Gondwana land called. And if you look at it, this is, we see really this map makes a good study. We see the continents are drifting apart. Stratigraphers will see also many things happening. Flooding of Africa, where there is Sahara, now there was a sea, all kinds of things. Also, you see not only split of Afri Africa and this, there is a split of Arabia from Africa. So, this is that it is visible. This match is not coincident. Kind of proved even by modern technology. He did not make these diagrams. I'm just showing it to just explain what he felt about it. Historians say, how come it came to his mind? He was an explorer. He loved Greenland. He took about six expeditions to Greenland. On two occasions on foot with sledge, he crossed the entire width of Greenland. He loved Greenland. He died in Greenland in 1930 when he was barely 50 years. He lost, got lost with his companion who was a local Eskimo in a snowstorm. His body was found in 1990 intact, about 68 years after. He saw, people say, while taking the ship from Germany to Greenland, ice, ice bars, thick bodies of ice. This could be very easily a 20 story building, floating on the ocean. And this is an iceberg floating on the ocean. You see, the greater part is under the water because of the density contrast. And according to some people, they saw the, how the icebergs split and drift away from each other all the time floating in the ocean. He draw the analogy. At that time, it was known continents are made up of lighter elements, oxides of aluminum and silica, dominant. Whereas oceanic crust are made up of iron and magnesium, high density. So his notion was the continents are fragments and blocks sitting on top of the oceanic crust. Maybe there is some portions, very little portion, submerged inside the oceanic crust, but essentially they are sitting there. Just like icebergs, they split, move away, continental drift. And you see, they are moving on top of the oceanic crust. There is no participation from the oceanic crust, the rock under the ocean into it. This is his first line of evidence, paleoclimatic. The glaciers moving body or rivers of ice on land, they flow just like rivers. But if you look at present day, glaciers cannot form in the equator area. 
you can have glaciers in the equator but it cannot be in the sea level it could be 3000 meter above the surface you can get it near equator in say mount kilimanjaro in, near the equator in, in east africa what you found rocks of the same age which is more than 500 years up to 500 million years old have direct evidence that they are formed by the act action of glaciers the rocks are called telites and they occur rock of the same age occur in very many separate continents in australia in south Af in africa in south america these are all partly or wholly in southern hemisphere but one component india in the northern hemisphere they are of the same age same rock compositions not only that he found the displacement direction the way that glaciers did flow when the glaciers flow they make striations on the hard rock like this and we can feel by finger in which direction they are moving they are giving a very consistent direction of flow and you are getting glaciers in the equator impossible unless it was a snowball art in history in art history, there are periods when the entire art did, did, got frozen. But that was not the case of snowball arts because similar age rocks in other parts of the world showed there are existence of deserts, there are existence of rain belt and all kinds of things. It is not snowball art. So his obvious conclusion was that if I have to have glaciers, they will have to have high latitudes closer to the poles. Because dominant part of these glaciated rocks are in the southern hemisphere, during the time of formation, they are together. These continents are together near the South Pole. This is the present the South Pole. And these continents, you see, these are all the southern continents except India. This cluster of continents was called Gondwana Land. The idea of Gondwana Land was floated by a genius called Suez. He was an Austrian paleontologist. And in late 1800s, he wrote three volumes of books. And very surprisingly, these three volumes have predicted everything that we talk about now, the plate tectonics. All you know, subduction zone. They are everything predicted without any data. Wegner never knew of these things. But he said they are together like that. This is the paleoclimatic evidence. Then came the evidence from fossils. This organism, which is like a crocodile, it's a freshwater reptile. They cannot survive in marine water. They cannot cross oceans. And they are found in the two sides of Atlantis, in the rock of the same age, the Mesoceros. Mesoceros are beautiful. What? Mesoceros are beautiful animals. They are one meter long, about 270 million years back. This is from Brazil. Then came other fossil evidence. This is Listrosaurus, size of a dog or pig, Harvivorus. This is a skeleton fossil from Germany. And they found if I have the southern continent, the distributions nicely matches. So there are continuous land connection between now separate lands through which they migrated to be dispersed nicely along these continents into the continents, which are now thousands of kilometers away. And this is a tree, a land tree, a fern, class of trees, is the leaf. They also. So when you put the occurrences of these fossils and bring the continents match their coastlines, they nicely fit. That is his strong paleontologic argument. This is class of trees, possibly have seen from Cold Belt, and this is the class of trees tree, about 30 meters tall. So we have now a southern continent called Gondwana. And they were there together 500 million years back, definitely. Look at the northern part. We are talking about the southern part of the Atlantic, the northern part. And we see there is mountain chains in the two coasts of the northern Atlantic, which are of the same age, same structure. They match. So if you close the northern Atlantic, we have been so far closing the southern Atlantic to build the Gondwana. If we close the northern Atlantic, they match nicely. So this is state bullet construction. Not only the southern continents did match, but as Abraham Otelia said, that this bulge of Africa, 
nicely fits with this. Incredible. So now we are having not only a single landmass called Gondwana, but we are thinking of a little after Gondwana, a complete amalgamation of all the major continents into a single continent. So from Gondwana to a, a great, great supercontinent, which is named Pangaea. And when it has been assembled, this is a very modern day assembly, 2014, you see the rock types and the age of the rocks matches. Now they are two different continents, but they're of the same age. These are all Archean rocks, those who are into it. These rocks, these are the areas giving us the oldest Archean continental rocks. So this is called Pangaea. So Pan means entire, Gaia means mother art, name given by Pangaea. Look at it, 1915, what Wagner did. He drew, this is the map of Pangaea, incredible. This is Pangaea, earlier this was Gondwana, one part, and these portions are forming another supercontinent called Laurentia, but at around 200 million years, they got together forming a single landmass called Pangaea. And one somebody joked if there are animals, intelligent animals from other planets who have visited in space, they would have seen Earth like this, a single continent, Pangaea. As I said, if you have a Pangaea, this is glacial area, and you predict these portions was in the equator. You look at the rock type, sedimentary rocks are the best indicators of environment. And you see there are deserts in subtropics, in the tropics, and these are the slopes. So this perfectly matches that the continents were together and the southern part were near the South Pole, Pangaea. And this is for the politically minded people. This, is, this would have been the political map of Pangaea. Had there been politicians like we have nowadays, India would have looked like that. This has been very nicely polished by this gentleman, Pietro Bon from Italy, who is a great philanthrop. He just was imagined. If it was Pangaea, then the African refugees could have walked into Europe and not the USA without losing their life crossing the Mediterranean. And this is Gondwana political map. You see, this is Gondwana land, and this is the Laurentia we are talking about. They are yet to join together. So Gondwana has many kinds of misconceptions in some of us. Gondwana existed before Pangaea. It was a portion of an even older continent called Rodinia. Rodinia broke and it broke into different portions. Eastern Gondwana, India, Antarctica, Australia, Western Gondwana. They got amalgamated and there was three separate land masses at around 500 million years. Laurentia, that is, North America and Greenland, Baltica, that is the main part of Europe and Siberia. And when all these things got together, we got into Pangaea. This is a quick animation. We look at it, what's happening. You see, fragments from Gondwana is traveling north and forming what would be Siberia and then China. The portions of Gondwana, this is Gondwana, which is now with Lawrence and Pangaea. First thing which started, breaking up of the eastern part of Gondwana and fragments travel across a sea that is called Tethys to amalgamate here with the, what is remain of the early part of Siberia and building up the China and Siberia. Look at it. Still, you see, Pangaea is nearly intact except for that, and you see vestiges of early Atlantic near about 200 million years. It has started to open. Northern Atlantic has opened, so it is older. Still, Gondwana is remaining intact except for these fragments. Wow. Western Gondwana, Eastern Gondwana separated. India, Australia, Antarctica separated with Madagascar. Atlantic Ocean opening, these three are together. Coming close to Cretaceous, Eastern Gondwana completely broken, three continents, India, and Southern Atlantic open. Look at what the India does. India is very adventurous. Look at the speed, you see in this side, you are watching the clock in millions of years. 
you see the velocity of India. South Atlantic open completely. This is the Union hotspot forming the Deccan Trap and this Rakade Islands. India went and rammed into the southern part of China, Tibet. We still have the vestiges of Tethys. As India rammed, it is an escape. Eastern part of Asia came down, forming the Indochina. India is still pushing. Still there is near Iran, the vestige of Tethys. You see, Japan and Sakhalin Islands came. This is about time. The entire thesis is lost, except this Mediterranean. So Mediterranean is very old. It is on Earth from about 400 million years back. This is the vestige of Mediterranean. And when India rammed, this is the reaction of Asia. Asia got squeezed, folded, faulted, mountain chains formed. We'll come to that later if time permits. Take a big jump from continental leap 1915 and 1920. Before I go into 1960s, there is one objection that was valid to this continental trip, but it is not sustainable. You know what they did to Wegner. Wegner was asked, what is causing the continents to move? He said, that his suspicion is that it is the tidal energy, the rotation of Earth and its interaction with the planets and sun. The tidal energy changes the shape of Earth, you will not doubt you all if you don't know. So this tidal energy is dragging the continents because they are floating on top of oceans like sailboats. He has no other answer possible at that time. Harold Jeffries, Sir Harold Jeffries, a father of modern geophysics, wrote a Bible called Earth. Possibly for 50 years, this was the only book in geophysics in Cambridge. He did the calculation and it right. He said that the tidal energy required to move a continent is one millionth time than what is required. So it is not possible. And the rest of the world started howling at Wegener. This is the tragedy of science. The politicians in science say that, well, you are saying this has happened, that has happened, and your evidence seems okay, but you don't know why it has happened. So it does not happen. Because you cannot explain, it has not happened. Very tragic. We come to 1960s and the input started coming from completely different evidence. Seismicity and volcanism. Seismicity is earthquakes. And we know when there are faults, two blocks of the faults move past each other, hard rocks. So a huge amount of friction has to be overcome and they tremble causing earthquakes. So 99.99% earthquakes are due to the movement of two blocks of rock across a discontinuity and a line. It is not continuous, it's broken. So there is friction and this frictional energy is released in the form of earthquake waves creating earthquakes. The first movement starts at a point called focus and there are three kinds of faults. And if you look at the seismic record, you can tell what kind of fault whether this normal tensional fault or compressional thrust fault or conservative strike safe fault has done it. What has been found, and this is unbelievable, you see it's only eight years record of the earthquakes that took place on Earth, which are greater than five magnitude, we possibly know. Just very simply, if you have a five magnitude earthquake, say about 20 kilometers below Calcutta, 60% of the Calcutta will be flat. So these are the bits. The earthquakes do not occur haphazardly. They follow certain birds. And there are places where there is no earthquake. These points are the focus. These are saying at what depth that is a source of earth. And you see, Japan cannot be seen. There are so many earthquakes. This is Andes. So they occur along certain birds. And there are oceans surrounded by such birds. But there is very little earthquakes. India, this part. This is oh, explainable. This, this, Siberia. This. Now, if you go by the analogy, the four blocks move, that lead to a suggestion. Is there movement taking place along these boundaries? This block and that block. These are not very nice, smooth blocks like that. But these are block rigid blocks. That's why there are earthquakes. And the other set of evidence came from volcanoes. 
these red dots marks all the individual volcanoes that are on land or above the sea surface seawater surface all active volcanoes single individual beds 85 percent of them are on land along these beds they follow exactly the earthquake beds about 10 percent are in the ocean they are also pretty like that so what is important is that we are seeing a nice conjunction between localization of the individual volcanic pits, vents and peaks and the zones of movement. And later discovery was made that along this bound where there are a lot of earthquakes, these areas where continuous almost lava is coming out. So these are volcanic in the sense there are no single single vent, but there are fissure or cracks. So there are areas of high heat flow. So material is coming along these boundaries from depth and the blocks are moving. Very simple observation. Many things happen after that. So we take a big jump. We come to this landmark contribution to science. For 1960, 61, I jump to 1968. I'll cover the intervening part later. A paper came, rises, very desperately, trenches, great faults and crustal blocks. The apex body of academic scientists in US and North America, these are not professional, not paid by the government, that include physics, chemistry. They declared this paper is one of the most significant contribution to mankind's knowledge in 20th century where you have papers by Einstein as well. This gentleman is William Jason Morgan, very interesting life. He has, he is a geophysicist. He has his undergraduate from Georgia Gatek Institute of Technology, did his PhD in Princeton. And since then, till he left Princeton because of old age, he was a faculty in Princeton. And he attributes this paper to some extent the encouragement from a gentleman called Frank Vine, possibly you know Vine Matthews Morley, the magnetic reversal time scale and sea flow splitting. I won't be able to discuss that. It is according to him, Frank Vine asked him to look at a global map on the wall. In 1967, he wrote a paper. He was doing postdoctoral work on the gravity anomaly of Puerto Rico Trench east of US. He sent a paper in American Geophysical Union meeting to be held in 67 in Washington, D.C. He sent it in August. Between August and December, something miraculous happened in his mind. He used to look at this map and he used to read all these papers. The papers are just the outputs I'm telling them. And all of a sudden, he came out with the idea of what is modern plate tectonics. He had these are individual rigid fragments called plates. So it is not the continents important. It is the plates which has ocean, oceanic, ocean continent. So this is African plate. This is South American plate. This is North American plate. And this is Indo-Australian plate. And I will show that actually now India and Australia is apart. This is European plate. So there are major plates. And he said these plates are in a state of movement. And these movements causing these kind of structures, crisis, that is those mid-ocean ridges where you have these new plates are created, trenches where they are destroyed and get faults. That is the transport faults like that, where neither things are created or destroyed, they just move past each other. It came to his mind just like that. And when he made the presentation, everybody expected another mundane presentation of gravity anomalies of Puerto Rico. Instead, he came out with a 20 minute presentation that kept the audience absolutely spellbound and the whole world was shaken. The answer to all the problems they are suffering from, putting the pieces together into a single format. He was a great fan of maps, a geophysicist, Princeton. And as a tribute to map, he took undergraduate students of Princeton University for 20 consecutive years summer field training in Beartooth Mountain in Montana, West US. And he used to spend there one year teaching them the art of making and reading maps. 
Thankfully, he's still alive, but because of his health reason, he is now in Harvard, no longer in Princeton. So now, if I look at the same diagram, continents are drifting because you see a fracture through which ocean is created. When you start it, there is no ocean. Now, when the ocean started to dip, it is not the continental fraction floating over the ocean floor. You see, the new ocean is created, material added symmetrically, and the ocean is widening. This widening is described by another genius as sea flow spreading. So, African plates separated from South American plate because that before that it was a single plate, Western Gondwana. Now it has into two plates. And similarly, we will see towards the end of this particular movie, a new plate is also created by separation of Arabian Peninsula from Africa. That was the picture that I showed as my in the, in the title slide. You see. You see Saudi Arabia is separated, and this is the famous Red Sea. Now we look at a cross section. Those who are not used to it, it is a huge cross section cutting across the globe. African plate, I cut a cross section and look from there. I cut a cross section. This is the Africa, this end, and this part is there. This is the rich creation rich of plate, rich creation of plate like that. Now, if you look at it, this is entire lithosphere. The skin of the orange. It has two components. Unlike the orange, it is not homogeneous. Lateral variation. One is continental part, the oceanic part. The oceanic part also underlies certain part of the continent. So when you talk about plate, we talk about lithosphere, not just continent. You may have plates which have a continental part of the lithosphere, an oceanic part. You have plates which are purely oceanic, like the Pacific plate. You can have plates which are more than 50% continent, like the Eurasian plate. So this is the plate. This is the notion of lithosphere and plate. So this is broken into plates, but unlike the cell of the orange, it has two components. So now from continental deep to plate tectonics, I have just like say Africa. This is Africa, oceanic part, oceanic part. This is the continental part of Africa, just example, which is happening, but I don't talk about that. Underlaid by the oceanic part of the lithosphere, this is asthenosphere. The tension created, just like between, say, this is also not talk of Africa, say, this is the Western Gondwana having two components, Africa and South America. Tension created, pressure drops. The asthenosphere being hot and easy to flow flows into it. Tension breaks it. Ice bar breaks. The moment it breaks, the hot material comes because of drop in pressure melts and creates new oceanic crust. Just like we have seen in the movie, the new oceanic crust is born. A new ocean is born. And this half of the ocean belongs to the eastern block, which is our Africa. This block, this oceanic crust belongs to Western block, South America. This is Atlantic with the mid Atlantic ridge. Difference, it is not breaking of the continents and dragging on the ocean. There is no difference between oceanic lithosphere and continent. Both of them are participating and both of them are fragmenting. And when they are getting fragmented, oceanic lithosphere is created. So, very lo easy logic. It started like that, it grew like that. So oldest part of the ocean will be here, lithosphere, symmetrically there. And as you move towards the ridge, the age of the ocean lithosphere will become young. And ideally, the age of the lithosphere here should be zero, just for the study. So this is the story. This new part is added to African plate. This new part is added to American plate. And this is the ridge. That means the oldest part of the new ocean Atlantic will be here and there and younger will be there. So these are the interlock fragments. So if you move one part of the interlock fragment, just like a jigsaw puzzle, all the other plates have to move. That's why each plate is a stable. 
So now we look at it. This place, South America, not a very nice, sweet name of a volcano, Mystic. So we talk about South American plate, means South American plate and part of the Southern Atlantic together, continental part, oceanic part. So you take the South America plate out, and here this is the asthenosphere below. This is like a jigsaw puzzle. The smaller pieces fit together. Here we are making the map of Asia and Africa. Each piece has its place because of the pattern match and the shape. These are like this. Plates fit like a jigsaw puzzle, like this, but one difference. The plates, the pieces are not of same shape and same size. And in this diagram, it is not to scale. You see, this is the Pacific plate, which is the largest plate. You see the African plate, second largest plate, South America plate. So if you join them together, that will form the Atlantic. Eurasian plate, 50, more than 51% or 60% is land. North American plate. Note, we are seeing India and Australia different, separated. Another difference, jigsaw puzzle fits on a plane. Here it fits on a circular spherical surface. Now the two persons behind the seafloor spreading. This gentleman, Harry Hammond Hess, Princeton professor, he was a commander of a ship, American ship during the Pacific War with Japan in the Second World War. He was a he is a professor. He was a professor in Princeton. He made three remarkable contributions to science. He discovered Giotts, possibly you know, named after professor and head of the geography department in Princeton, Giotts. He discovered sea slow spreading together, but separately with Robert H. G.S., who is from United States Geological Survey. And at his very young age, he made a providential utterance, and he was rebuked for that. He said, there is every possibility there will be lavas. Lava means the magma which comes to surface, which are ultramafic in composition. That means very hot and having at least 18% NGO. The elderly person got very annoyed. And what he, they said to him reportedly, he said, you are too young to make such big proclamation. Wait till you grow older. So he kept mum on that. What is, the, and this gentleman, he is from USGS, he also described the same phenomenon and he coined the term sea floor spreading. The one important aspect of this case is that he died in harness. He lived very short, 63 years. He died in a conference table. He was chairing the conference in Woods Oceanographic Institute, an institute jointly owned by MIT and Harvard University. And the meeting was to decide how to handle the moon rocks that man has brought from the Apollo mission first time in India, and he died on the table. And when he first realized this thing, his arguments are more intuitive, no high tech. What is that? He said that the ocean bottoms are free from any major weathering. In continents, you deposit sediments, they'll be weathered away. In ocean bottoms, if you deposit sediments, they won't be weathered in normal circumstances. So the thickness of the sediment will tell how long the sedimentation is taking place. The longer the sedimentation taking place, that means the seafloor over which the sediment is accumulating is old. His observation and information was that in Atlantic, the thickness of marine sediments increases from the central part of Atlantic towards the sides, very symmetrical. He has no other information. From which he felt there must be a reason for that. Central part, the distant part, has different ages. That means oceanic crust, he used the term crust at that time, is very young there, so you have very little sediments. And the oceanic crust is very old there, that's why the sediment is thick. So he put it together in mind. That means you are creating oceanic crust where it is young. And possibly there is a mechanism where you are taking care of this oceanic crust. He did not spell it out, but he indicated that this is a cycle. Oceanic crust created, and getting older and getting destroyed. He was so impressed and charmed by the simplicity 
an elegance. He called this geo poetry in a United States government report. Everybody accepted. See, for spreading the same phenomenon described by Robert Gage as well. Look at here. Sinai Peninsula, Red Sea. This is where now we can see. If I see at a picture like that, I say, well, there must be two plates separating I from each other. Just like Wagner's idea, you match western boundary with eastern boundary. Even this corner matches here. This plate is very exciting, called FR triangle. And you see a mid-ocean ridge, Red Sea. So we'll cut a cross section here to see what's happening. Red Sea. This is Nile Delta. And you see the lithosphere got thinned by a type of fault or normal fault. When you extend any rock body, they form normal faults because you see it is hanging all about. And at one point in time, the lithosphere ruptures, so Red Sea is created. That means in future, if the things going the way there, Red Sea will widen. And as a result, this Persian Gulf will close because Saudi Arabia, Arabia is the more. And you have to close the Persian Gulf. Already it is very shallow. And another very exciting part where you can see this mid ocean ridge white. It is standing like that above the sea level, like a mountain. And rift it is called because you have a rifting taking place. One part is going away from another, another part is this is a character of reefs. Iceland. To the middle of Iceland comes the boundary between Eurasia and North America. Three dimensional map, you see. Iceland is very close to Greenland on the continent also, a very shallow part, part of a continent at once of a time. And this is the deeper part, and the mid-ocean ridge comes to it passes in. A very interesting story. There are two parallel ridges, but maybe told sometimes later. This is Iceland, and this is my reflection. If you walk in Iceland, this is a helicopter shot. This is a ridge rift. Tension creates cracks. Eurasia to the right, North America to the left. And this is a very adventurous individual who was one of a very famous geology students of Calcutta University. And he ended up as a supremo in banking. He ended and retired as the senior president of a very famous bank, but he never lost touch in geology. And inspired by me, he took a trip to Iceland and he sent me these photographs. He claimed he is the only man at that moment who is belonging to two continents, this foot on Europe, that freedom. Not the, my reaction was that please don't stand there any longer, otherwise you will have the fate of Jarashandho, if you remember what happened to Jarashandho. And this is 200, 2021 picture. In a similar place, Iceland has put a bridge, bridge between continents. This is the rift, and this rift is now filled with the salt that coming through it. This side is Europe. This side is. This picture is taken by Sir Anthony in this summer and communicated to me by Devadit. So both of them are ex students of Calcutta University. Now they are in Japan. So this is the scenario. You stretch the continent, you generate rift, and start creating oceanic crust, and the ocean extends. And look at the movie. Now you can see it. You see magma coming, plates moving away. And these lines marks the growth, symmetrically material added to that side on this side. So there is a ridge because there is a bulge, hot material coming, pushing it up. So it's a ridge. And at the same time, it's a rift because there is a crack to which things are coming. And they are symmetrically added to it. And if you look at this very simple cartoon, it shows another interesting thing. This is the present ridge. And you see, as you go away from it, the age of the ridge changes. So if I ask you, what was the geography when, if I go back to 145 million years, you will say, in 145 million years, only this part and this part was there. This entire part was not created. That means this much part of Atlantic was not there. Atlantic was narrower. And this is the present thing. So this is a very, these are called isochrons the rock portions that are of identity. And if I look at the same map, a very sophisticated version, just for the more interest of one, if you look at Bay of Bengal and Indian Ocean, there is a symmetric age, uh, 
about 45 million years to 80 million years. This is 45 million years and these are 80 million years. So there was a mid-oceanic ridge in this part of Indian Ocean truncating at Sumatra. That ridge stopped to expand and died at around 40 million years. Very interesting story, maybe some days we'll discuss it. We come to another part. We have now an expanding normal fault right plate boundary. And now we we'll look at another kind of plate boundary, which is a strike slip fault. In mega thinking parts, an extremely creative Pujo Wilson, who was a professor at Toronto University. He has a, he is possibly the most respected geophysicist of that time. Very interesting. He has a PhD in structural geology in Princeton, and I'll show. He used paleontology to make another revealing discovery. He said, and let me let me tell you one more line. Probit, uh, if you mind, if I overshoot by 15, 20 minutes. No problem, please continue. I started very late. Okay, I lost about 12 minutes. So if okay. I'm allowed, please, please, don't please be continue. disgusted. I can stop any moment. But I think this is very interesting reflection on individuals who did science. Being a very bright student, doing his undergraduate from Toronto, he went to Cambridge, natural. There was Jeffries, Jared Bullard, his students, after whom the Bullard Laboratory is in Cambridge. But he was extremely fascinated by boating and sailing. So instead of attending classes, he used to whistle around the corridors, which was a taboo in Cambridge, or he was sailing in the Cambridge River in his boat. And he did not like it. So he came back to Toronto and went to Princeton, did his PhD in structural physics. When he was asked by an interviewer, when he was in Cambridge, what is his reflection on that? And he smilingly said, well, had I attended the classes of Sir Harold Jeffries, my life would have been much smoother because I would have learned the basic mathematics in a very quick way rather than going through the school of hard knocks. This is the tribute to Jeffries by a great mind like Tojo Wilson. What he said? This was a long time enigma, but when we have the maps of the ridges, the ridges stop, then again start, but not along the line in the same direction like that. What could be the reason? We can see from this map, these are false, but that was not known at that time. This is model to Joe Wilson did. The models fascinated the world in its simplicity. What he used to do, he used to carry a piece of paper, a pencil and a pair of scissors. In front of the audience, that includes professors of great US universities and students of undergraduate and the reporters. He'll bring out the piece of paper, mark a line like this and cut it and put it on a flat table. He said, this is one plate. Now it has two plates and put his right hand, put it like that, put his left hand. And you see the plates are moving away from each other. And the new gap is created, new oceanic material is coming, seafloor spreading. This is the same age as that, that they're symmetrically different. Not only that, if I measure the distance and measure the difference in age, we know what is the rate of spreading, what is the velocity between these two plates. But what is more interesting, you see the plates are expanding here. Plates are doing nothing, just moving past each other. No plates are created, no plates are destroyed but they are just moving past each other. As long as the plates at the same velocity direction, they'll move parallel to it. These are faults, but very interesting kind of faults. We call them transform faults. Why? Because this is a constructive plate boundary where plates are created, the plates are created. And this is a conservative plate boundary, neither destroyed nor created. So the plate boundary behavior changes from this to that. So here the constructive plate boundary transformed itself into conservative one. Wow. The whole world was just shaken. And he's con I, I, if you read through this paper, he made a fantastic statement. This is the beauty of science. Beneath all the wealth of details in his geological map, fifth generation folding, three generation metamorphism, lies an elegant, orderly simplicity. The beauty of science elegance of science in its simplicity. 
that completely changed. But this is all theoretical. It's all from his mind. So he floated like a tender. Will there be anybody in the science who can prove this? Looking at these faults, Leon Sykes from Columbia, Laman Dohati, a very young PhD scholar, not even having his PhD with Jack Oliver, another stalwart from Columbia. He took up the challenge and he looked at the seismicity generated in this part. As I said, the seismic signal tells you what kind of faults are there and what is the sense of movement. Here it is a left lateral. This block is moving to the left. If I look, switch it, then it will become right lateral. And lo and behold, Sykes said exactly what was the prediction. This fault is a dextral strike slip fault. Though apparently the displacement is sinistral, but that is not the case. Because it is not. The ridge was there, then it was cut by a fault. They formed together. Transform fault. Transform fault is another very important property. The displacement remains the same all along the fault because this is the velocity of plates. And displacement stops abruptly, unlike in normal faults, where the displacement gradually dies away. It does not happen like that. Look at this video. Midoceanic ridge already exists in new material added, red. So you see the plate is growing. And then the transmission length of the transform is not changing, but moving like that. Okay. So this video shows what is the flow spreading and what is the role of transform into it. So these are all weak transforms. And as the model says, they form together. It is not like they are continuous and displaced. One reason they are forming because the ridges has to be maintaining the same trend because they develop perpendicular to the velocity of these two vectors. So if you have to bend the boundary, it is like to bend like steps. Reduction agrees, transform forward. So you attain what you want to do. You want to change the overall trend. We come to a very exciting part on Earth where you see a transform fault on land. This is North America. This is Pacific Plate. This is San Andreas Fault. Let us look at it. This is about 15 million, 10 to 15 million years back. It is, this would have been the position of San Francisco. Los Angeles, Pacific Ocean. This is Mexico, Baja California, Gulf of In 15 million years back, if this is the current boundary, which is a straight line between USA and Mexico, 15 years back, this boundary was solved. Let us see what happens. This is the San Andreas Fault. Dr. Rovino Rai is sitting right there and possibly giggling at this. It is showing which way they will be moving. Now the movement of the plates. You see Pacific plate moving. San Francisco stationary, but Los Angeles moved northward is matching here. This is San Andreas Fault. When you fly into Los Angeles, there is Carrizo Plain, where you see the trace of San Andreas as a ridge with a deep growth. And you see the river courses have changed to it. The river flows into things, then changes like that. The idea was that they are once continuous. This block moves south, this block this way. So the river course has changed. Boy, this is large scale thing. And there is a historic thing where you can see there is a big earthquake in 1906 in San Francisco. More people died because of the fire that followed the earthquake. And that earthquake has displaced the fence. Luck was that the San Andreas Trace was passing through there and the fence was continuous. That earthquake has shifted the extremity. We have to go further. You go to the suburbs of San Francisco. Unbelievable. This photograph is taken in an October. You can see the maple leaves. And you cannot believe your eyes. In San Francisco, the pavement is broken. Well, no. This is the trace of San Andreas. This block moved that way. This block moved this way. Burning question arises. I am creating a plate here. And these are the transform force. Neither created. So if I'm creating a plate as per the seafloor spreading, and there must be, because the surface of the earth has constant area, the volume of the earth is not changing. To measure, keep the balance, I have to do something to destroy, quote unquote, the plate. Otherwise, the plate will be keep on growing. All the plates will be keep on growing, and there will be 
that the entire conservation of mass and area and all things will be done. So it has been found, again, the work by Jack Oliver and his, his Brian Isaacs and C. The Psych, 1968 paper, they clearly showed these zones where you have the volcanoes on the ocean and also on the continents. There, this plate is going underneath the plate that containing the volcanoes. Analogy was of a thrust fault, hanging wall block, the foot wall block is going underneath. But there is a big difference between the two. But the movement sense is like that. When you are squeezing thing, contracting thing, then thrust spots develop. Because prior to thrust spot, the distance between this line and that line was longer. After thrust faulting, this block moved closer, so the line has shot. So they are having large compressions, and one block is going down. But that is the only similarity with thrust faults. It is not exactly the same sense a thrust fault it is. The thing that is happening, quite unlike the thrust faults we see on continents on the lithosphere does not go straight like this, then they banged. No problem would not have solved. The lithosphere bends and goes underneath another lithosphere. Please hold on a minute. I am at a meeting at Chitoma for a call for book. Check it. So, though they are different, they described as trust fault. They are because they move in hanging wall, but hanging wall material bends. Unless there is this bending, it cannot go underneath. It is going under, now we all believe, because the pull of gravity, this portion of the lithosphere being older than these portions of the lithosphere, they are denser and they are sinking into a sonosphere. So it is a gravitational pull that is pulling it down. And you cannot have a scenario like this, then the tectonic so I say, when you talked about dry and fresh peel of orange, this is what I meant. Unless you put water into lithosphere, it is absolutely essential to water to percolate inside the lithosphere and make it quote unquote softer so it can be bent and it goes up. This is called subduction. This plate is called overriding plate. And, this, and because of this bending, a deep furrow is created. That is called a trench. You cannot have a deep furrow if it is like that. The deepest part on Earth, you all know the challenge and deep, is about 11 kilometers is one such trench. So now the parity is restored. We are creating, we are creating in the mid oceanic reach the sheets crossed. Now we call it lithosphere and we are destroying it. So the parity, there's no change in the surface area of the earth. Like a quick look at this thing for the learners. This is the trench overriding that you see. Now, one thing is very interesting, you know, we have volcanoes there. Why these volcanoes? The oceanic plate and the sediments taking a lot of water into it, either free water or they are associated with minerals. As they go deeper inside it, the water, because of heat, comes out of the mineral structure and the free water also. Because they come out, expand. The volume expansion leads to what we call melting. And melts being lower density, higher buoyancy, erupts as volcanoes. These are the volcanoes when formed on top of an oceanic plate are called island or volcanoes. So this is the subduction zone, a very crude model. Note one thing, there is no change in distance between the volcanic rock and the trench. But constantly the subducting plate is changing its position they are coming to the trains. There is no change. It becomes very important when you do the geometric calculation. And we look at now Japan, where we have this convergence, and we'll see what this convergence done to us. Japan, very interesting. Pacific plate going under this plate, plate. Philippine plate going under this plate. And we look at an island, Kyosu, a volcano called Unjen one of the most deadly volcanoes on Earth. And this is 
a volcano very south of Winsend, a new volcano came out. It, it is in 1960s, these photographs is in 1960s, a new volcano coming out, which is nothing but a, if island arc has a volcano which is below the ocean, now gradual building of the volcano because of eruptions coming at surface. And this is what happened in Unjain in 1991. Unjain volcano is here very close, about 300 kilometers east of Nagasaki, the infamous town which was bombarded by the US with an A bomb. Look at the video. It will show the deadly face of volcanic eruption. This is the boundary of a volcanic crater. And we'll see because of the extreme gas pressure, the crater is blown, just breaks. Dome collapse, we call it. And it is a mass of glass, gas, and fine particles. I stop it. I go back there again. What, is, what I'm showing is that the dome collapses and charged material made up of fluid, gas, liquid, and fine particles follow the valley slope at a speed of more than 100 kilometers an hour. Be charged in gas, the temperature is around 100 degrees C or higher. They follow channels or valleys and come to the flow. Watch what they're doing. The dome collapsed. The cloud is moving. Now we see they're moving down the valley. This is a river valley. They're following it just like a river. Only difference 1000 degrees C and 100 kilometers per hour. I'm sorry, I cannot give you the sound. I can hear it, but you possibly are not. The cloud coming, the fire track, the firemen running for life. They never expected this much. This is just disaster, catastrophe. Just a minute or two. The video is covers only about 35 minutes, seconds. You see, this is dead. All quiet outcome. 42 people perished in that eruption. 40 Japanese villagers and two volcanologists from France, Katia Kraft, this lady, and his husband, her husband, Maurice. The magnitude of the eruption was so unprecedented, they never expected that the vantage point from which they are photographing it, those are pre-digital photography days, 1991. They never expected, there is no record of the eruption could be so violent and they are engulfed by the gas, so they are all burned to ashes. This is a picture of Hawaii, and see how much risk the geologists, volcanologists. This is heat proof. About two to three minutes, they will keep you kind of cold because they are standing by you, see yellow and red. The temperature is around 1000 degrees. See, standing on an incrustation of a lava lake, the lava is boiling below the upper part, just like the crust of a cake is solid, and she is there to collect the magma sample hot because she wants to know the gaseous composition. We have been talking about showing about ocean going under ocean. Now you have oceanic part. You see Andes going under continental part, creating the Andes mountain chains and the volcanoes. So this is oceanic plate going underneath continental plate, releasing water magmatism. These are the zones of high friction. That generates the earthquakes and giving the earthquake belt along this. Earth. These zones are called subduction zone, and this is the trench. Look at India, showing this is a separate plate. This is Himalaya. Position of India for the last 80 million years, it came and caught Himalayas. Again, just you watch what he's doing here. What India does to it. Just to refresh our memories, what India has done to 
Asia. It rammed and then it moved 300, 3000 kilometer inside Asia. Its point of first contact is 3000 kilometers south. Pushed Asia, this Indochina was formed and lot of mountain chains and cracks developed there. This is India. This was the Tethys Ocean between India. Before it collided, it collided and it stopped there and you have the Himalayan mountain chains. Before the collision, because of the subduction, just like Andes, we have the volcanic arc. And note, the contact plane between India and Asia is changing. First contact was there. Then a continent came into the subduction zone. Continents, by definition, 2.7 grams per cc or 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter. So they cannot be subducted because, as I said, the subduction is taking place only because this portion of the plate is denser than what is below. This portion of the continent of plate is lighter than that. So they got jammed and the crack propagates. Material is transformed from Indian part to Chinese part. This is a video by a famous researcher. And she made it a tribute to Peter Moll. Okay, Tanya Atwater is her name. This is very actualistic, made in late 1990s. India, death is Asia. Oceanic part of India, oceanic lithosphere, continental lithosphere, thick continental lithosphere. India comes, touches. This is the first contact. Pushes. Two things happening. Because India will not go down, but oceanic part will go down. So oceanic part breaks off underneath India. Delamination. And you see the contact between India has migrated from here to there. India is still moving. India is peeling the lower part of the mat, the plate, an Asian plate. An Asian plate is squeezing going up, forming Tibetan plateau. Plus, because of this protective lower part is not there, the heat is making it go up. And the last part, another contribution of T.J. Wilson, the Wilson cycle. What Wilson noticed, it's a nature paper. He remind you, world around geophysicist, structural geology PhD, he uses pure paleontology. He noticed north of Atlantic Ocean, north Atlantic Ocean, there are two types of marine fossils. Both are shallow marine fossils of between 400 to 300 million years old. But they have complete different affinities. And he found it is logical because there is big Atlantic Ocean. So the Western part has one affinity. Same time here, another affinity. But to his shock, he found that there are portions in both sides of the Atlantic where the two different types of fauna occurring together. That made him realize and propose that Atlantic has opened once earlier, then closed, and then opened again to form this one. And this opening and closing is called Wilson cycle. This is simplified one. You have an old Atlantic called Iapetus, Proto-Atlantic. Oh, don't worry about the ages in early value. So you have faunal relief, really Pacific. Then they closed for the future. Into that they join in Silurian. That is, this is before Pangaea opened up. They are forming Pangaea as a result, they are closing. Then it again opened Jurassic in northern part, earlier Cretaceous in southern part. But when they opened, it did not follow the suture. So that some portions of it really is in this side of Atlantic. So this simple observation that two different relims occur together made this landmark discovery. That the plate tectonics processes are cyclical. Ocean open, ocean close, open again. Atlantic Iapetus closed from the mountain chain, then again closed, forming the Appalachian mountain chains and the Caledonite mountain chains. Then it opened again, forming the present day Atlantic. This is Wilson cycle, moving, continent splits, rifting. Then crack, we call after drifting, starts the drifting. New oceanic crust created, symmetrically added, transform falls, ocean widens, just like Africa and South America. Then 
maybe someday later we'll talk the behavior of the plates changes this entire plate and this river plate a subduction zone starts at this contact between the ocean and the continent and that brings the entire ocean coming getting subducted underneath this plate forming the volcanic arc erosion degrees subducted actually what happens after the subduction the earth falls apart but anyway and then just like in the himalayas india comes it's asia bang the himalayan mountain chains and the volcanism stops because you see delamination as in the himalayas this is wilson circle so an art cell created plates erosionic ridges transfer faults comes there goes subduct but story is not that simple if time permits during the discussion i will talk about the nuances and shortfalls of this there are many things that we do not know but in a very simplistic way this is the story of the tectonics this is what earth today and our observation teaches this past rebel patterns pattern suggest process and process part this prediction and this is the prediction art will look from 50 million years from now this you see the mediterranean is closed instead of the ocean sea there is a mediterranean mountains go 200 million years in future we are back to the super continent again called pangaea ultima so what's the story start with pangaea break up art form pangaea again the process goes on and in our student days calcutta used to tremble with processions and the common slogan was told che cholbe things will continue it is continuing i think i spoke enough why is possibly too long and maybe many of you are thinking if i am allowed to speak in bengali beta budo ke bolte diyeche thamle hoy so i stop here this is time for your tea i cannot offer any anything other than this cup thank you for listening thank you very much now the house is open for discussion i would expect uh, that the students would uh, interact at this session so if you have any question please i i this an appeal to the students don't be shy we grew up in an environment where we used to think if i make a question ask a question it will only prove my ignorance that's not the case so don't be shy okay unless it is uh, meant to disturb someone any confusion comes to your mind because i am a professional teacher so you are most welcome to ask for clarification or questions don't be ashamed and don't feel that if i don't ask question we will be taken as too shy it's not like that but the normal reaction should be any confusion ask questions फोटे so the idea is that very proven record is there there is a supercontinent called rodinia named after two russian gods it's very interesting russians name it rodinia we i i wrote it here panatia because panatia is a supercontinent which is very short lived and many people think that it is just an extension of rodinia this rodinia is not i i have i don't have the slide set this rodinia has a maybe maybe okay but it will take time was mainly centered around the southern part of atlantic very close to south pole it was assembled at around 1000 million years before present this rodinia broke started breaking at around 750 million years before present so well before paleozoic and the breaking was such that it first broke into two or three major components the first major component is the gondwana land this one which has the southern continents gondwana that is south africa 
Africa, South America, and Arabia making this western part of Gondwana. Now it's a single continent, and the eastern part of Gondwana is India, Antarctica, Australia, and those kind of those fragments which are now part of China. So they are together forming the Gondwana. So Rodinia broke into major components, of which one, the largest component is Gondwana land. And this Gondwana land later joined with the three northern components. This is a fragment of this Gondwana land. Laurentia, which is partly North America and Greenland. This is Greenland and this is North America. Baltica is Europe and Siberia. They together first joined with each other, forming a continent called Laurentia. And this Laurentia, at around 200, 250 million years back, joined with the Gondwana land to make Pangaea. So when the Pangaea started to break, it is the same story. You first got the Laurentia out of it, a Gondwana, then East and Western Gondwana separated. Then gradually, Eastern Gondwana started to fragment. So this is the scenario. Now, the thing is that that Rodinia was sitting, if I have a global map. Rodinia was sitting near the South Pole in the southern part of Pacific. There are still vestiges of Rodinia at near core mantle boundary. I think I can talk about it, but it will kill the whole evening. There are seismological evidence of presence of material which is related to subduction that form the Rodinian thing. It's like a ring. So Rodinia was sitting in the southern part of that. There are controversies. People put Rodinia here, people put in the equator, people put in the northern part. But the majority of them try to argue they are between equator, they are sitting there as a big continent. Then they split into Gondwana land and Laurentia. And this Laurentia and Gondwana land again came together for me like that. Okay, I mean, if I can, I hope I won't bore you too much, but. Can you see this? Yes, sir. This is assembly of Pangaea about here. Gondwana and Laurentia collision near the equator. So when the Rodinia broke, Gondwana was in the southern part. You remember we just showed the ISIS and other things. And Laurentia on the northern part of the equator. These two things collided to form the Appalachians and the Urals. You remember we have been talking about this Wilson cycle. That is the formation of Pangaea. We have very good control over the timing and events of breakdown, breakup of Pangaea. Why? The reason is that The time of breakup of Pangaea can be recorded in the ocean floor magnetic signals. We do not have ocean floors older than about 200 million years because, as we have seen, they got subducted. So they, we lose their magnetic signature. So breakup of Pangaea is known very well. But assembly of Pangaea is debated. So as you go far back in time, the Rodinia or even earlier supercontinents, are mainly based on paleomagnetic and metamorphic rock evidences. This is the breakup of Pangaea, we already know. So the, exactly when Pangaea became a bona fide continent, we do not know. Is oil constraint breakup because we know these things. These are very easily known. So if I put the breakup of Gondwana and breakup of Pangaea, it will be fairly accurate. But to trace the details of the supercontinents, even Rodinia, the supercontinent before Pangaea is prone to many questions. Thank you, sir. This is the flow chart of all this. Anyway, go ahead. Shows the joining and breaking up from Rodinia to Pangaea. You see all these components joined, we call what I call Panotia. Then it broke into Gondwana and Laurentia. Laurentia, many people call. It. They joined together in Pangaea, then they broke Gondwana and Laurentia again. Yes, go ahead. Now, anybody else? May I? Sir? Sure, go ahead. Anybody? Tapos, 
Okay. I am really illuminated with your nice talks. Okay. And just a little query, is that a question? That uh, nowadays the lead tectonics has come in forward and before the Mesoneoarchean, people do not know much about the tectonics. They, at some groups, they ascribe it to the lead tectonics maybe, mm -hmm. or incipient plate tectonics business. Mm -hmm. But you see the cycle, is this cycle is global or sometimes some parts, plate tectonic is operative and lead tectonics is operative simultaneously in the different parts of the globes? Okay. Okay. This is a very interesting issue, which is completely intuitive and conjectural. The logic is good, but it's very difficult to collect data on it. If I understand your question correctly, you are talking about lead tectonics, I mean stagnant lead. That means just like the orange shell, the whole lithosphere is a single plane. Is that what you mean by lead? Yeah, I said even the part of it, at least okay. I should say. The thing is that this is a phase Earth has passed through, and this is a phase some of the planets are going through also now. We study Venus, we studied Mercury, and we study Mars to understand our plate tectonics. And people say that there are phases, especially in the early part of the Earth. I am not going into the some introduction to the creation of lithosphere would have failed, but the looking into components, it was just like an entire thing. The idea was that lithosphere created was created as a single continuous body, just like the ring of the orange. Then it got fragmented. What did fragment it is a million dollar question from crystallography, mineralogy to impact of meteorite, all kind of thing. Now people are going more into more of changing their crystal structure, changing density, and therefore one part structure. Lead is called stagnant lead because unlike the plates, they're not moving. They're remaining stationary. Earth inside is hot, but it is holding the heat because, you know, plate tectonics is the most efficient way of cooling the earth. Mid-oceanic ridge volcanism, volcanic earth, volcanism, island earth. So earth is cooling. The more plate tectonics moves, the more earth cools. So if you stop plate tectonics, earth will stop losing its internal heat. So lead tectonics, second lead is that the whole plate, all the plates are joined together, no relative movement. But most of them now suggest, including the computer model like Terras Geria and hardcore field geology like Kevut, this suggests, and it includes includes some Korenaga, a very talented person, Japanese from Yale University. They said it is episodic. They showed the heat loss and other kind of thing. They said that there are phases in the early part of our history. The whole lithosphere became a single lead, or stagnant lead, because that is not movement. Then again, it did break. Break in certain portions where plate tectonic did operate. If I bake it into three plates, like here crack, there crack, then there is plate tectonic between this, there is no effect of it. And they said it's become episodic. Possibly the leads again join together. And again, a phase of stagnant lead. One reason of thinking like that is in the earlier days, earth being hot and lithosphere is created by melting of the mantle. Earth being hotter, some calculation even 300 degrees C hotter than present day in the portions of Arlean, there is more melting of the mantle. And any melt of the mantle in general is crust. So the crust was thicker. More melt means more thick crust. And more melt means more deeper thick melting. So crust and the lower part of the lithosphere together made a very thick lithosphere. The thicker the lithosphere, you need more energy to drive it and you need even more energy to bend it unless you can bend the lithosphere you cannot subduct the largest folds on earth are those subduction zones so if the lithosphere was very thick it has to be very slow and it will be very 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 difficult to bend it you cannot subduct so that was one of the reasons why the stagnant lead co concept is gaining some kind of support so the current model is that they are pulsating phases of stagnant lead interspersed with the 
modern style they call it modern style black tech talks thank you any other question i think a few questions are there uh, from the youtube also in youtube uh, can, can i can you transfer it to them no i yeah, uh, i'm uh, trying to uh, uh, may i pass yes, it to you please Uh, sir, how does a collision zone differ from a destructive trade boundary? I could not get it. Can you can you speak a little slowly? How a collisional zone? Sir, how, how does a collision zone differ from a destructive trade boundary? Okay, any destruct any trade boundary is destructive because a, a convergent trade boundary where one plate is going underneath another plate. Okay, if I go back to this. Generalized summed up slide. If so plates are created here, only oceanic plates are created there. It is difficult to create continental, but that's another story how continents are formed. So we are restricting our cell generation of oceanic plate. You need oceanic plate, just to summarize, to generate continental plate. They are product of some kind of massaging of the oceanic plate that gives you the continents. So you generate it here and it goes there. It is destructive in the sense that one plate goes underneath another and it vanishes from our eyes. So it is a, a collision thing is that when just like as I shown you, when you so this is a destructive plate boundary. It is ocean India. We call it collisional boundary when a continent or fragment of a continent comes into a subduction zone and the subduction zone is also a boundary of a continent so overriding plate is continent and now this under thrust plate is also a continent we call it collision why because continents the, both the continents have same densities and they are lighter than the material in the atmosphere so now what they will sink so this is collide so a destructive plate boundary Ultimately, if the plate has a continent sitting on top of it, like in here, it will change into a collisional plate boundary. But that will never happen in case of the largest plate, Pacific. Pacific has no continental component. So no matter how much you subtract Pacific, there won't be any collision. So if you have a collisional boundary, then the subduction is bound to stop after some time. <laughs> so that will no longer remain a plate boundary just like india has become a part of asia still there is some movements along this and that is an aiming but that can be discussed in a later okay sir uh, thank you oh, hello hello hello, hello. hello sir, uh, can we can you hear me sir sure i can hear you please go ahead yeah uh, sir i want to uh, i i have uh, two questions to ask uh -huh. uh, first sir the first continent uh, how do you think that the first you are we call it r how do you think that the, that the, the first continent was formed was it formed by vertical plate tectonic mantle overturn or original movement or or it was formed by uh, just conventional plate that that we are seeing now this, this is the first question okay. and, uh, and 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 second question it is a more lighter lighter one uh, don't you think that uh, that professor wilson should be awarded nobel prize because his paper uh, 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 the, uh, did, did that Atlantic close and then reopen was published in Nature in 1966? There are two questions that I want to ask. There is no answer to your second question. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> even the American physicist saying so much high thing about Jason Morgan, but the Nobel Committee has other preferences. They usually they never uh, used to recognize uh, the uh, non quote or quote unquote non fundamental things. Okay, so you can question why nobody from information technology ever won a Nobel Prize. The information technology made the second revolution more important than the industrial revolution. It changed the face of civilization or not. But nobody has ever gained any recognition by any of these Nobel committees because they say they have just applied research. But entire medical science nobles are applied research. So anyway, so the second question has no answer to it. The art yeah, yeah. is like a still very enigmatic. It is becoming a very fascinating game for many petrologists who are geochemists and who thinks they can do some tectonics. 
they think that the metamorphic signature and paleomagnetic signature, though the older the signature of paleomagnetism, the more unreliable it kind of lead to an old supercontinent R. It is not the continent supercontinent. The supercontinents and continents are not the same. Supercontinents, yeah. to our knowledge, forms by assembly of smaller of continents. continents. So yeah. you have to first generate a continental crust. Mm. This is the fundamental question. When and how did the continents form? Nowadays, we know continents can only form in subduction zone. Because subduction zone, say between ocean and ocean subduction zone, it is an ocean equator, but you are generating continental crust, these island arts. So this is how you are generating continental crust. But you are not generating any new material. You are just changing the composition here. So now it is believed the subduction zones are the zones where continents are growing by attaching material to it. So the question is that then the first ever continent, is it a product of subduction? Because you have to, as I said, if I can talk like that, there are two very major anomalies when you look into the plates and lithosphere. What are the major anomalies? The anomalies are there that it's a very interesting anomaly, which we tend to overlook, but which is there and which we cannot ignore. If I look at this diagram, this is a continent, lithosphere, continental part, oceanic part, and this is the common part of lithosphere underlying the ocean continent. I mean, the continent, crust, continental crust and oceanic crust. They are very similar in composition. These are two completely different. So the anomaly is that the first anomaly is very significant that the average age of oceanic lithosphere, average weight, density of oceanic lithosphere, that means about 70% of the oceanic lithosphere is more dense than the asthenosphere below, over which they are sitting. A very interesting thing. There is a tremendous mechanical disequilibrium at the bottom of oceanic lithosphere. 70% of the oceanic crust, oceanic lithosphere, are denser than the asthenosphere, yet they are sitting on top of that. This is a mechanical anomaly. And even deadly anomaly is that this continental crust sitting over the lithosphere, which is a mantle part, they are in complete compositional disequilibrium. That means in case of oceanic crust and oceanic mantle, it is perfect chemical equilibrium because if you melt the oceanic mantle, you generate the oceanic crust. So you can mass balance and chemically balance. So they are in perfect chemical equilibrium which is completely absent below the content. So from which we know, if I melt this mantle, by direct melting of mantle, we cannot create continents. Or I can create continent only when I can melt the oceanic lithosphere, oceanic lithosphere. From oceanic lithosphere, you can extract a composition of continental melt. Very simple thing. You do experiments, you take mantle, mantle is ultramafic peridotite, under no circumstances, extreme, in ex extreme case of differentiation, which is almost impossible, you cannot extract a granitic composition from an ultramafic rock by just by melting. It has to be two states. The mantle peridotite melts into oceanic basalt. You melt the basalt, you generate granitic melt. That means the genesis of continent requires two stages of melting. One, the mantle peridotite melts to form a basalt, then basalt. There is another way of melting, just like in moon. If you make a magma ocean, the entire outer part of Earth, about 4,000 kilometers, it is believed, within 300 million years of formation of Earth, the outer part of the entire Earth, at least about 1,000, become completely molten called magma ocean. Similar thing has happened in moon. And when the magma ocean formed, I draw the analogy from moon, the highest temperature feldspar, the anorthite, being the lightest and to form earliest, floated on the surface of the magma ocean. Then gradually the magma ocean did crystallize to form the basalt below. If you look at the moon, 
the lunar mare, the maria, the black parts are the oceanic part made of basalt. The shining part is the anarthosite continent. This is the only other way you can generate a continental rock just like anarthosite. But this magma ocean products got all recycled. We don't have any vestiges of that. So it is still debated. But still more and more people think that we had to create the oceanic by melting the mantle. That is, that's why it is called crust. It covered the mantle. Then we selectively melt those portions and possibly in subduction zones. We break the stagnant lead, break it and start subduction because there are density variations within the stagnant lead, which is purely basaltic oceanic crust. So because of density variation, one part goes underneath, melts, because earth was very hot then. So the slab melts, which does not melt nowadays. You cannot melt a subtractic slab now. It has stopped melting. Last time it did melt, mass scale is about 2,500 million years back. So in the Archean or in the Hadean, earth was hot. So when you take this oceanic atmosphere, it melts and generates continental crust. So R is hypothetical. And we still have no answer when and how the first continent formed. But we are sure it is not the lunar model. It is mostly a stagnant lead oceanic lithosphere, preferentially getting subducted and melted. Thank you, sir. Any more question? Hello, sir. Yes, go ahead. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, this. Please, please. Yeah. Sir, I wanted to know what is the main reason of the convection currents that uh, occur in the mantle? Like, I really wanted to know what is the, uh, the reason behind the high temperature that occurs at the core mantle boundary that drives the currents? Like, uh, okay. I couldn't find okay. a proper answer. Okay. okay, this is a very good question. And I, I, I first start with in a light mode. You give me another opportunity to talk for two hours, I can explain it. Okay. But it's a very good question. But one very simple answer is this. Yes, what is the major source of heat in, in the earth? Earth has two sources of heat. One from inside, earth's own heat generated within the earth. And other, the heat that comes from sun. Entire heat that we see on the surface of the earth, 90% of it, we owe it to sun. So the entire sedimentary process is mostly controlled by sun. Sun seeds control all the surface processes. Earth has two heat sources of its own. One is the primordial heat. When Earth formed by accretion of particles and masses, and heavier masses going to the center, so this travel from periphery to the center, the kinetic energy changed into heat. So Earth's core started, started to warm up. So the core became hotter. This is Earth's own primordial heat. That is the heat generated during the formation of Earth as by accretion of particles and different masses of different sizes. From fish size to almost a continent size, moon size bodies, they came accreted to form the earth and the inner part got hot. That heat is retained because after so many processes, the outer part of the earth, the mantle, I'm not going into its origin, is silica rich. Silica is non-conductor, very poor conductor. So the silicate minerals are very poorly conducted. So what are we are having? We are having a very hot central mass. Because of gravity, that mass, the core, is made up of iron and nickel. It has other components, broadly iron and nickel. It has radioactive components, possibly potassium in it. Some aluminum, some amount of silica is there, but potassium is a very good candidate there. So that heat is retained in the Earth's core. And what is the other source? The radioactive elements which are mostly concentrated right at the crust and in the mantle. So Earth has one heat, which is retains from its primordial heat at the bottom, and another heat it is generating by radioactive decay. Now you see, Earth being hotter than the surrounding environment, a hot body loses it. Core is hot. Core is as hot you believe it or not, the inner core or outer core boundary at about 500, 5,150 kilometers, the boundary outer surface of the inner core has the same temperature as the surface of sun. But this hot material 
is always trying to cool by transferring heat from the core to the mantle. So there is a huge temperature difference at 2900 kilometers. The top part is mantle, lower part is core. So heat is escaping from core into the mantle. And many people say maybe there are males also coming from core into the mantle. Another story. So this is why the core mantle boundary is so hot. And the other part of heat we generate in the mantle, it does not affect the core mantle boundary, is escaped through the crust into the atmosphere. But doing the heat balances and the age, Earth's core could have been solid by this time if it is only primordial heat. Earth's core has some radioactive element potassium that is balancing the heat loss, so core is cooling slowly. So this is why the core boundary, core mantle boundary is hot. And why convection? Very simple. You have a cold body. You have a cold body sitting there. We have a cold body sitting there. And this is the core of the earth. And the cold body is insulating, just like a water pot sitting on fire. Water is not conducting, poor conductor, it is below. So what happens to water? It starts to boil. What is boiling? Convection. Columns of hot water comes to the top, and colder water goes down. The cycle stops and keeps on going. This is convection current. You have to have a non-conducting or poorly conducting material. It's very difficult to convect an iron rod. You put it in one side in the fire, being very conducting, the heat will escape through it. But if you put a bowl of water or a milk, they are very non-conducting. So if you heat it from the bottom, the hot material has to come because it is expanded in the volume in the bottom. So they will go up. And when it comes to the top, it cools down. So then again, it has to go down. So the convection cycle starts. So that's why the convection is taking place in the mantle. But the rate of convection has changed because earth is cooling down. So rate of convection has also changed. Some people believe. Mm. Thank you, sir. Sir, hello. Ah, yes. Sir, when you are telling about uh, you, you are telling about the uh, division of South America and Africa, I am unable to uh, understood the uh, trailing edge of the South American plate lies where. Can you tell it? Yes, sure, South American plate trailing edge definitely. If you look at the global map, I, I have it. Most of the maps truncate at that level, but I think I have one. Yeah. This is the boundary with Antarctica. South American plate is going like this. And this west of Andes, Peru, Chile Trench, sort Caribbean, where you have the Haiti earthquake. Then meets the southern Atlantic reach, comes there. This is the shape. And this is a boundary. And this is a, another small volcanic arc called Scotia arc. It is South Sandwich plate. It's a very small plate here, very remote plate here. So this is the configuration, the bottom part. Trailing edge means a passive continental margin. Margin between ocean and sea, which is not a subduction zone. So this is the trailing edge of the South American plate. This is not a trailing edge. This is an active plate boundary because you are having these plates of Pacific Ocean. This is Nazca place going underneath South America, forming this Andes. So it is the trailing edge and it is the leading edge. Okay. If you look here, Professor, I understood. Yes. Which which is which is a uh, sorry which was. Uh connected with Africa before uh, this uh, is, dividing? Th these two passive margins, because here is the plate boundary. OK? OK, sir. OK, sir. Thank you. You see, this is the before they split. 
Now, after splitting, they came like that. Okay, so these are the trailing edges because the boundary between ocean and the continents is not a subduction zone. So they are called trailing edges because they are moving in this direction. They are moving in this, so they are trailing. If a train moves, the tail of the train is trailing behind the engine. So this is trailing edge. This is trailing edge because it is moving in that direction. Very interesting thing happening with Africa. It has practically no active boundary, except in here where you have Mount Vesuvius. It's about this much part is a subduction zone. Rest is all surrounded by mid ocean in the Another very interesting feature. I love this, sir. Okay, thank you. Any what other question? The, I have a question that from Povitra Jana. What are the modern tools to detect the process of plate tectonics? Can GPS be a part of it? Oh, sure. If you are into GPS, you can explain the observations of GPS. GPS is used in the Himalayas. This is a data based on GPS. It's only about 20 years data we have because GPS is not out. These points, they have measured the movement velocities of the plates. It is not between two plates. I know where Africa is now, its latitude and longitude of this point. Latitude and longitudes are fixed with respect to the globe, not respect to the Earth's crust. A globe is a geometric feature, and you draw the latitude and longitude, and they are attached to the globe. So you find a place here, and if measure the latitude and longitude of that place, and GPS gives you the latitude and longitude of the same place, same point after some time here. So it shows the plates are moving, and these velocities are called absolute velocities. They are not measured with respect to another plate. They are measured with respect to a coordinate system which is fixed to the sphere called arc, a geometry body, not crust. And you see what is happening. African plate is going that direction, European plate, Indian plate is moving. Don't think it is that much velocity because this is the length five centimeters. So Pacific plate is moving northwest, not respect to anything, but the Earth's coordinate axis, that is Earth's rotation axis, 10 centimeters a year. And you see, this is called absolute velocity, the Pacific plate moving that direction as compared. So there have been to be rift. And here, Asian plate is moving in that direction, Pacific. So there is happened to be a trend, a subduction zone. This is GPS. Without GPS, we cannot measure. Now, you saw there are very interesting observations. Across the boundary between India and China, geologic boundary. Please don't be mistaken. I'm talking about all the disputes in Ladakh or etc. No. I'm talking about the boundary here, main frontal thrust where we have the major earthquakes. In Nepal, this part of Nepal, there is almost one kilometer. There are very sensitive electronic devices put across it. And from this electrical sensitive devices, they make two things. Whether the devices are making their position changing with the help of GPS and whether the relative distance between the two are changing. So the accuracy of measurement of plate velocities are in sub-millimeter scale. So we can easily use GPS and GPS has given us the best tool now. 15 years earlier, the resolution of GPS, correction of GPS was not more than three meters. The measurement you make would be as wrong as by three meters. Now it has come down to some millimeter scale, especially if you use the army satellites that are used by NATO and other people. The data is so accurate that is incredible. Yes, Dr. Guho, D.B. Guho, how a lighter lithosphere goes down into a denser material lithosphere very sure good so that's a very good question okay the answer is that question. is a stupid question of course no 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 Divi, it's a fantastic question that you asked because everybody takes oh it is only natural in the subduction zone now i made the proclamation that you have the lithosphere the beauty of the lithosphere is this this is a very simplified cartoon. Someday maybe I will able to talk about lithosphere. Lithosphere, when it is created here, it is hot. So it is low density. Mm. As the lithosphere, because of accretion of material, pushes away from it, it becomes cooler. 
and as it cools it becomes denser it not only become denser it becomes thicker because when it cools the material immediate below is also cooling because through it the heat is conducted so lithosphere is getting cooling and at the same time is gaining thickness because cool older material cold because the material got cold because of losing heat through the lithosphere attached to the bottom so lithosphere is actually wedge shaped it is just like this tapering near the midrashian bridge then thicker and it becomes denser because cooler after 20 million years of its formation the lithosphere becomes cool denser than the asthenosphere below so in normal circumstances if you have to subtract a oceanic lithosphere it must be older than 20 million years it is very difficult to subtract a 5 million year old lithosphere you are very correct so it is said it is just like a pulley system this part of the lithosphere is denser this part is even dense so when this part goes down it pulls it it pulls the entire lithosphere down and we say now this abduction is actually driving the plate the gravitational force here lithosphere is much more dense than there than there than there so this denser material is going down and pulling the lithosphere at the tail with it. Your question is very pertinent. That's why you cannot subtract the continent. Because continents has average densities of 2700 kilograms per cubic mm. meter, 2.7. And the asthenosphere is a density of around 3.1, 3.2, like that, 2.9 to 3.0. So you cannot subtract. But lithosphere oceanic becomes denser than three. Right. You are right. Thank you, Dr. Guo, for sitting through the talk. <laughs> anyway, there thank few you. More questions you. there, I think. Yeah, is a question. Yeah. Why Indian plate has moved faster rather than other plates? Oh, very good question. After all, they are Indians, okay? So they're always ahead in all kinds of things, positive and negative. If you look at Indian plate boundary, that's a silly question. Sir. No, not at all. Not at all. Actually, it is possibly. We think that silly should be always sitting before the questions. Okay, it's not like that. Don't worry about it. Uh, look at this man. You remember this plate boundary? Talk? Don't worry about this plate boundary. It was not there. What is happening about the Indian plate is that when you are making it separate, look at it. Wait till India starts to move. India has not moved yet. India starts to move. Slowly, slowly, together. Now it picks up speed. Why it is picking up speed? Now, there is a plate boundary created between India and Antarctica, which was not there before 61 million years. The plate boundary is a ridge, and the ridge is pushing India from behind. Understood what I'm saying? Just like a talagari. Someone is pushing it from behind the ridge, and there is a subduction zone on the other side of Tetris, which is pulling it forward. So India is, is acted upon by two forces supporting each other. It is not just the pull of the subduction zone that is bringing India coming to collision with Tibet. It is also the push from behind. That's why India is moving so fast. It is a, it is a unique movement in so far the recorded in geologic history. India moved so fast that is because it was a push from below south and pull from north. Okay? Yes, sir. Thank you. I think there is another question from Shukriyo Kobiraj. Go ahead. Yes. Why earth inner code is a solid iron, not liquid form? Oh, wonderful. You have to ask the physicist. You know who is that famous physicist? He was from MIT. Okay, he has an experimental physicist high pressure. The reason is that it is known from very early time that the earth code is... First of all, let me... Uh, uh, and said it from another angle. Till about Harold Jeffries did some calculation, we thought 
Earth is entirely solid. So first we think why we know it is a liquid flow. And he calculated the mass of Earth very correctly from Newton's laws of motions and gravitational thing. And we know the size of the Earth. So he calculated mass of the Earth and rotational speed of the Earth and the shape changed by the Earth. He figured out that if Earth is an entire solid body of equal rigidity, Earth would not have this bulge. Equator radius larger and polar radius shorter. You cannot have that. So Earth must, the mass of the Earth is such, if it has the same a solid, then solid will have a density. Then Earth's rotational velocity, angular momentum, all will be different from that. So from this argument is heard that art must have a low rigidity material near the central part and liquids as a low rigidity material. So that's right. So then we all thought art is a liquid core. Then another study seismology showed that art is the same. Art will have to be a central iron, solid iron, because we know the what the exact pressure at the center part of art, which is very easy to calculate. At that pressure and that temperature, iron cannot stay in liquid form. It's a physics argument from physics again. The density is so much, the pressure and temperature is such that it cannot be in a liquid phase. So that's why the central part of the art, the core is solid. You cannot have it. Okay, it has to go. Another reason is that Earth is cooling, so central part is cooling, so the liquid iron is gradually. In fact, the observation is that the inner core is gaining size. The outer core, the liquid part, is becoming smaller. And one day, the entire core will become solid and will be all gone because the entire core means solid means there is no magnetism, just like in Mars. Mars had is a liquid core once, but no longer, so it will cool down. So Earth has to be liquid solid core. But the solid core was first discovered by Barch in this particular experiment. Okay. What will happen in the coming million years? I mean, will the continents reunite like at the beginning? Yeah, that's what in million years, I think you possibly could miss that thing. Yes, we believe if we understand our processes and processes go the way they are going with their velocities of the speed and the direction. In 50 million years, you possibly see the Mediterranean will be closed and 250 million years, it will be again like that, another supercontinent. And again, we'll begin by splitting up. How the tectonic underplating occurs? I, I, I am not sure. Underplating has a very specific Meaning, I am not sure whether you meant that underplating refers to addition of material at the bottom of a solid body that is called underplating. Okay, so in island arts or other places, you have magma attaching at the bottom of the lithosphere that is called underplating. If you meant that, that is very simple. You know, you have a basaltic bed generated from the mantle and it is moving upward because it is less dense than the mantle. For example, let us see here. So this is what is, if we have the mantle material melts, you see the slab is not melting. Any subducted portion of ocean lithosphere is called slab. Slab is releasing water, water is increasing volume. At the same temperature, if you reduce the pressure, you generate melt. So mantle melts and mantle goes up. So this melt is less dense than the mantle, so it goes up. But when it comes to a continental lithosphere, for example, continental lithosphere is less dense than the magma. So the magma stays there and underplate. Now what happens? Next bunch of magma comes here, hits this melt, and again partially melts that magma, which is already underplated here. So you have a basalted magma attached to the bottom of a continent. Another phase of hot basalt came and partly molten the basalt and part melting of basalt will generate highly silicic and acidic gravitic kind of magma, which is lighter than the rock cell. So the mantle, the melt will come and come to the surface. 
many portions of the magma do not reach the surface because of this density contrast. So this is underplating of magma underplating. You have tectonic underplating also. Material get transferred from the subducting flat to this because of water vapor pressure. Cracks develop here. Water vapor pressure develops cracks and transfer this matter. We call it underplating of sediments. Why are there no earthquakes on the equator? It is nothing to do with the equator. Good observation, but it is not like that. If you look at the earthquake distribution map, it is not the question of equator. We do not have much of a plate boundary. But here you see this point is on equator. This is equator. This point is on equator. You have an earthquake. But the belts are not parallel to equator. Why? Because there is no plate boundary except for here. This is the Galapagos area. This is Cocos plate, Natra plate. Here they have a mid-oceanic ridge parallel to equator. Here you have seen some portions, and here some portions. Otherwise, if we have a plate boundary parallel to equator, you will have equator. It has nothing to do with equator because it is nothing to do with the shape of the earth or its latitude. It is the boundary between the plates. So there is no earthquakes. It is not equators. It is not because there is plate boundary. Say there is no plate boundary, say. That's why it is not equator, but there is no earthquakes. So any other question? Uh, then uh, now I would request to PT to propose the vote of thanks. Yes, sir. Piti, please. I feel privileged to have this opportunity to propose the vote of thanks. On behalf of the Association for the Culture of Art Sciences, I express our deep sense of gratitude to our honorable speaker who spared time from his busy schedule to enlighten us with his lucid and thought-provoking speech. This will surely be encouraging us in our future endeavors. We are thankful to our honorable principal for permitting us to organize the third Golden Jubilee Lecture. Last but not the least, I take this opportunity to thank the House of audience who graced this occasion with their presence and active participation. Thank you all. A big hand.